Awesome. Jess, if you're the one who requested this meeting, you have to have your camera on. So for those who don't know, this webinar came about because Jessica Spencer asked me some questions about doing an eight by eight 32 touch and how to implement doing better with her uh, database. And I said, well, why don't we just do a little Zoom with a couple of people on it? So we ended up having over a hundred people registered for this. And a lot of people want to watch the recording, which is why I am recording it. But really today is kind of a discussion about just at Jeff Glover and Associates, how we um, throughout the years have implemented our database plan. And so I want to first talk about kind of like the difference between 33 touches and what we do. And honestly, at the end of the day, all of them are the same. You know, they're all touches to your clients. It's just how often are you touching them and what is it that you're saying? So at our organization, Jeff used to follow something that's called a four by four by one by 12. So as I was going through and creating the notes for this class today, I decided that I have rewritten our database plan and we no longer have four touches, we have five. So I know the title of this class is Four Essential Components of Database Marketing. Um, surprise, it's actually five. And we're gonna go over the fifth added one that I've decided that is now part of our database plan within our organization. Um, because we have been doing it, we just haven't counted it as one of them. So before we jump into that, a little bit of groundwork so that way you guys um, you know, know why we're here today and know why, in my opinion, I think database is important. Other than Jessica Spencer asking me to do a call with her and instead I'm just gonna do a call with 100 people instead. <laughs> um, database is important for a couple of different reasons. So before we get into that, actually I'm gonna, for those of you that have not been to a Glover U event before, which I'm assuming the majority of you have been being that we posted this in the inner circle. So you probably know Glover U to some degree. Um, my name is Taylor Kerrigan. I'm the Director of Operations for Live on Real Companies, which is Jeff Glover's family of companies. He owns 13 different businesses, all relating back to real estate, and I oversee the operations for them. Prior to having that title, I was the Director of Operations for Jeff Glover and Associates only, which is his real estate team. We sell just about 1,000 homes a year. We're located in Michigan, um, and I've been in that role for, gosh, I've been with Jeff for nine years. And so um, within the last couple of years, I hired my replacement as the director of operations and essentially moved into a little bit of a different position, but I still consult on the business on a daily basis and oversee the, the larger operations. So when we talk about database plans and things we're doing to improve our business or things we're doing to sell more, those conversations are involving me. Um, so that's why I'm qualified to talk about database plan today. Um, for those of you that also don't know, I do teach the operations mastery course. At, at Glover U. So if you are in that course, some of these things you're gonna hear um, were things that we talked about on one of our recent calls, but I'm gonna expand a little bit deeper on them um, since we have that, that extra time today to do so. Personally, the reason why we think database is important, and I always kind of joke when I tell this story, for years, um, you know, Jeff was selling 100 plus homes a year himself as a solo agent, and he didn't even keep track of a database. You know, when I first started working for him back in 2013, I think that was, I asked him, hey, you wanted me to do this mailing to your past clients, where do I find their addresses? And he basically told me he didn't know. <laughs> he didn't have any sort of Excel sheet or anything like that, that he was keeping track of them. So obviously we quickly changed that and started to track every client and every person that we had a real estate conversation with. So step one, not one of the five, is obviously if you are not tracking all of your past clients or your sphere or things like that, please do put them in some sort of Excel sheet. Part two of that, the other thing is when Jeff did start tracking his database, he had it in an Excel sheet, which was great, yet when the computer crashed, so did his database and we lost all of that information. So using a system like a Google Sheets or a CRM or something like that is obviously super beneficial for being able to keep everyone in one spot. Um, when we look at our business over the years, so back in, and I'm going to give you a couple stats, and I'm going to share with you kind of what changed between 2017 and last year that allowed these percentages to increase. So in 2017, 15% of our business came from the database. 2018, 24% of our business came from the database. 2019, 32, 2020, 45, and last year, 52% of our business, so just under a thousand homes a year, came from our database. 
So from 15% back in 2017 to 52% in 2021. The only thing that we changed between those years was implementing a database plan. And so we're gonna walk you through today what those um, five key components are. And then I'm gonna dive deeper into each of them. But the one thing that I want to make sure that everyone gets out of today is when we're in the type of market that we're in right now where you know, buyers and sellers are harder to come by, there's more competition, the cost of a lead is outrageous. Your best opportunity to convert a new client today, well, a client today, not new, is through your database. They already, in most cases, know you. They hopefully, in most cases, like you. It's just the game of staying in front of them on a consistent basis so they don't forget about you. I was in Portland yesterday with Sarita at a um, one of our tour stops that we're doing, and she was talking about how her car salesman, for example, she has no relationship with her car salesman because he doesn't stay in front of her on a consistent basis, right? So there's no relationship tie there. It's very similar when you are a real estate agent. If you're not staying in front of them on a consistent basis, they could drive past an open house and happen to walk through and now they've bought that house and they never even thought of you because you're not staying top of mind for them. So anything that you're doing in the rest of this, you know, I know that we're obviously already on May 19th and we're through, you know, a portion of, of the next quarter, but between now and the end of the year, I want you to have a goal to implement at least two to three, if not all five of these components that we're going to walk you through today to help you convert more business before the end of 2022. Okay. So before we get started into the five components, I first want to talk about the two different types of databases. So within our organization, we break up our databases into two. Number one is our past client and sphere database. And that's primarily the one that we're going to talk about today. Number two database is the exchange database. So the difference between the two is obviously the first database is past clients and sphere of influence. So people who have either done business with you or are in your sphere in some circle. That could be a you know hairdresser, that could be a friend, that could be a friend of a friend, whomever, that goes into database number one. Database number two, the exchange database, we classify those people as any decision-making adult that we had a conversation with regarding real estate. So if we're at the Starbucks, you know, here in downtown Plymouth and I'm waiting for my coffee and I have a, you know, 10 minute conversation with someone about the real estate market and we exchange business cards at the end, that person is now going into my exchange database. If a Zillow lead comes in and, you know, they inquire on a property at 123 Main Street, that person goes into my exchange database. Okay, so as far as looking at the numbers of our database, we have close to maybe 8,000 people in our past client and sphere database, and we have 80,000 people in our exchange database. Obviously, if you actually keep track of every single, you know, sign call that you get, Zillow lead that you get, realtor.com, open house lead, whatever it is, that's how that number is going to be a lot higher. And with the database plan that we're going to talk about today, some of the things that we include, we can transfer over to the exchange database. The reason why you don't host client events and stuff like that for your exchange database is obviously in relation to the cost, right? And we're not necessarily farther down the funnel with them yet as them um, having a connection with us and so forth. But we obviously want to stay in front of them, right? Because at some point they reached out to us. So that's the difference between the two databases. And I wanna make sure that that's clear because sometimes you'll hear us talking about that at Glover U events, talking about the exchange versus past client. Everything we're talking about today with the five database components, that is in relationship to the um, past client and sphere database, okay? And so for those of you that joined late, um, surprise, I decided that there's actually five database components, not four, because as I was going through and writing everything out, I realized that I think with our day and age, it's time that we add the fifth one. And it's actually going to be the one that we start with today, too. Do not ask the question. And, and please, guys, you know, obviously, I, I didn't create this as a normal Glover U webinar where we blast it out and have like 600 people on it. There's a reason why I did it as a meeting versus a webinar, because I want us to have interaction. I want you to have questions. I want you to ask me to dig deeper on some things if you, if you want me to. So do not ask the question, do you use other tags within those two databases? 
So our past client and sphere database, we do track things like sources and so forth in there and sort them by what agent worked with that client. Um, for the exchange database, we do use different tags and they're always um, in relation to how soon we think they're looking to make a real estate move. So we follow the following tags if you wanna write these down. Uh, we do a zero to seven, a seven to 30, a 30 to 60, a 60 to 90, and then a 90 plus. And so honestly, that is a um, whole other webinar that we can do on how do you follow up with exchange database leads after a long time period, right? And that's like drip campaigns and stuff like that. Um, we can talk about that obviously in one of them. If you guys see enough value, I'm happy to jump on these every so often and do it. But those are the different tags that we use. And then we just categorize them based on how soon we're, we think that they're looking to do something, okay? Um, and then Stephanie just asked, what's the best way to ask questions? Just throw them in the chat. And then we'll obviously have time for questions at the end. Okay, so let's jump into the five database components. So the first one that I want you to write down, and this is the new one that I've decided that we've introduced, is social. And so by social, I have five different ways that we speak to our database um, and on a social media platform kind of way. And the reason why I've added this, and I think that we haven't had it in the past as much is because it was never like marketing to your sphere and your past clients on social media was never really a thing that we thought about before, right? We had business pages, we had a personal page where we promoted our past sales and, you know, hey, I've got this under contract or I've got this just listed, whatever it is, but we never actually intentionally tried to connect with our past clients and our sphere via social media. A lot of people, when I tell them, hey, do you add all your past clients on Facebook? They look at me like I have two heads. Honestly, it's the best way to stay in front of them and know what's going on in their business, right? You, you see on a daily basis what they're eating. Everyone's getting the Mexican pizza today, right? You can send them a Taco Bell gift card and let them know that you'll buy the next one. You know, there's tons of different ways that you can stay in front of each of these people if you are adding those people on Facebook. So, before um, we jump into that, so the first step under social, what I want you to write, and I keep seeing every so often it says my internet connection is unstable. So if it gets really bad, let me know and I can try to switch Wi Fi's. So, step one under social, very important client Facebook group. So, this is something that we implemented in the 2020 year within our organization. Every past client of ours is encouraged to join the Facebook group. And within there, we do a couple different things. One, we try to host a twice a month giveaway. So for example, the giveaway that's happening right now is it's National Pet Month. We have them dropping pictures of their dogs or cats in there. And at the end of the month, we're gonna give away a $25 gift card, okay? So it's a way that we're staying in front of them. You know, we're doing something fun. We're getting engagement in the group. Um, and again, it literally is costing me $25, okay? Also things that we post in the Facebook group. I was just having a, a coaching call this morning with someone um, who's working on implementing theirs. You do a market update. So if your MLS releases your market stats once a month, when they get released, download them, read them, go live really quick and share your thoughts about what's going on in the market right now. Looks like average sales price is up, you know, 12%. Um, our average closings are down 8% and our data is on market within the Detroit area is 21, right? Do a quick three to seven minute video. Now on a side note with that, once you do that video and post it in your very important client Facebook group, also download it because we're gonna use it later when I get to some of the other bullet points, okay? That's one of the things you can post in their market updates. You obviously don't wanna to be too salesy. Another way, using it as a referral um, platform. And I'm not talking agent to agent referrals. I'm talking, hey, I need a painter. Hey, I need um, you know, someone to finish my basement. You know, all of the different things that that um, you know, we get asked for on a, a daily basis, right? Create it, um, ask Sarita, for example, again, Sarita's top of mind for me because I was with her yesterday, but, but she's known as Ask Sarita. Everyone in her database knows that if they need anything, the person you reach out to is Sarita and she's gonna give you the best recommendation. A way you create that is by having it in your very important client Facebook group, 
Okay. So those are some of the things that you can promote in that Facebook group. Again, honestly, I think a lot of people get concerned with doing it because they're like, oh my gosh, what am I going to post? All you have to do is come up with two to three things that you're going to like topics, meaning market update, referral, something that's going on in the neighborhood, whatever it is, and then just force yourself on a weekly basis to think of whatever that content is for that week. You don't have to recreate it every single week, okay? So that's number one under social. That was very important client Facebook group. Next, um, personal Facebook page. So this is something that we encourage all of our sales associates to do. On your personal Facebook, obviously there are, are you know, if you can get your, your Facebook friends up to 5,000 as fast as you can. That's obviously Jeff's you know, um, suggestion that he always gives. What I encourage our salespeople to follow is the five by five by five. And I see Sarah just joined and she knows that I bring this up all the time. The five by five by five is essentially on a daily basis, five days a week, you should force yourself to do this. Number one of the five is friend five more people. Number two of the five is comment on five people's posts that you normally wouldn't. And then number three of the five is slide into their DMs. <laughs> but what I mean by that is like so many people post stories, right? It's very easy to reply to the story and say like, oh my gosh, love that outfit. Or, oh my gosh, your dog's so cute you know, whatever, just to start conversation with them, because obviously it pops up in their messenger notifications and you're at the top. So if there's someone that you've been trying to talk to that, you know, you think could be a potential client of yours, a great way of starting that conversation is every so often sliding into that, those DMs. I feel so weird saying that, but yes, please slide into your client's DMs. Okay. But my point is, is obviously you're staying top of mind with them consistently. So if you force yourself, and I'll tell you, the time that I do this every single day is usually between 9 and 10 p.m. I go through the five by five by five. And David asked me to repeat it. So number one was add five new people. And the side note of the way that I decide who I'm going to add is I look at someone who, you know, I think has a big sphere of influence. I'll look at who's liking and commenting on their posts. And that's someone who I'm trying to add, right? I'm trying to expose myself to their network. Number two is commenting on five people's um, posts that you normally wouldn't. And then the third is sliding into their DMs, okay? So that was part two of social. C, part C of social is what's the image that you wanna portray on social media? If you're following our suggestion of adding as many of your clients on social media, how are you portraying yourself? Obviously, we wouldn't want to try to stay away from politics as much as possible and, and controversial conversations. You know, are you doing a good mix of personal versus professional? I try to force myself on a weekly basis that my professional posts never outweigh my personal posts. Hence why sometimes you just see a picture of my garden because <laughs> I realize I'm getting out of balance, okay? So you need to pay attention that you're not, you know, people will not follow what you're posting as often if you're just constantly posting, just sold, just sold, just sold, just sold, right? I should be able to scroll your page and see a good mix of your personal posts and your professional posts. At the end of the day, people wanna work with people that they feel like they relate to and so you need to come up with relatable posts or things that um, you know, people can connect with you on. And this is a good um, part for me to mention. Robert just asked the question, how many posts do you aim for in a week? I usually try to do five a week. Obviously, you know, some weeks plus or minus, depending on what's going on. But if you're wondering what the heck do I post about, we actually have a brand new social media calendar at Glover U. If you text the word social, S-O-C-I-A-L, to 55444, it'll get sent to you. And our marketing director did a really good job of saying like, okay, on Monday, you know, post a picture of a recent restaurant that you've gone to and you had a great meal, you know, and tag the restaurant. Like that was something that was a personal post. Then maybe the next day is a business post. And that breaks it down for you. You're just gonna text the word social to 55444. 
and I'll drop it in the chat too. And that really breaks it down for you. But my point that I wanted to make sure that you get out of that is what is your image on social media and is it something to be proud of? Okay. For example, myself personally, I kind of feel like I've been branded as the animal person, right? Everyone knows that I do a lot with the real estate or with the real estate, with the animal rescue. And so they engage with me on those posts. Obviously I love it because I like to give back to, to our community. And it also helps me create an image on Facebook where I can connect with people that I normally wouldn't. Okay. And then the last one that I have under social is Facebook groups. So we already talked about the very important client Facebook group, but force yourself as far as your database component. Um, this one's kind of a little of a caveat, but how many Facebook groups are you in locally? And how often are you posting or commenting in them? So I know that this one's a little bit different because it's not specifically related to past clients and sphere of influence, but I felt it was important to add. And so an example of this could be, you know, we have one here locally, it's um, Northville Happenings. People will comment and say like, hey, I'm looking for a good place to take my wife for our anniversary dinner. How often are you forcing yourself to comment on those and kind of be, be known in that community group? And so my, uh, again, it doesn't relate, I guess, necessarily to sphere of past clients, but if they see you in there and then they also know that you sell real estate, you're just staying top of mind again. Does that make sense? So anything you can do to join those local Facebook groups and then make it a point to comment or engage in them on a weekly basis. Okay. So to recap for social, we have very important client Facebook group the five by five by five, what is your image on social media? And how many local Facebook groups are you a part of? Okay. All right, the next database component that we're gonna cover is the phone. So this one is probably the one that people dislike the most because it actually requires the most work, but it's always going to be your most effective. So under phone, I want you to write the letter A and I want you to write four calls. So people always ask the question of, all right, that's fine. I'll call, you know, four people or I'll make four calls a year, but you know, what am I saying to them? So our rule of thumb when we're creating our database plan is that we're calling them twice a year surrounding local events that we're doing. And then we're also calling them twice a year surrounding holidays. And I'm going to dive a little deeper into what each of those are. So for events, we host an event in April and we also host an event in August, September. Bef about 30 days before each of those events, all of our agents are encouraged to call their clients and invite them to the event. If you were on my operations mastery call last or this Tuesday, you heard me say, I don't care if you know that they would never attend the zoo event, we're calling and inviting them anyways. And the reason why we do that is because we want to make sure that we're you're, you're calling and you're offering them something, right? You're calling and saying, hey, listen, I want to invite you to this event that I'm hosting, and it includes free zoo tickets, for example. If you're, you're calling them, it's a reason, again, we're staying top of mind, and that's the whole goal with the database plan. You never know when real estate is going to come up for someone, and we want to make sure that if it is, we're the first person that we think of. Okay, so we're calling them for the, the two events that we host a year. One again is in April and one is in August. Obviously, whenever yours are, call 30 days before it. But make sure, and this is a, a side note and we'll talk about it when we get with the events. When you host your client event, you always wanna make sure that you're hosting it right before your busy season, right? There's a reason why we're, host, we're hosting that event in April because we know that that's the start of our selling season. We're also hosting it again in the summer because again, we have a lot of people who try to do things before school starts, okay? So you're calling two of them around surrounding events and then two of them are surrounding holidays. So the next one is the Thanksgiving calls. So if you're on our team, you know that these are referred to as database calls. We create an entire week, the entire week before Thanksgiving, all of our agents are expected to go through their entire database and call every single client and let them know that they're thankful for them. Why do you think that we do this at Thanksgiving? Someone throw it in the chat or unmute yourself. 
because they're going to be around their entire family for holidays. So they talk about you. Yep. So Holly is a previous operations mastery student. So of course she got an A plus on the answer, but it's true. If you think about it, when do the holidays start, right? Everyone starts getting together for Christmas parties right around Thanksgiving. And I want to make sure that if real estate comes off or the economy comes off, you know, I'm the first person that they think about when it comes to buying or selling. So yes, David, we are exemplifying gratitude and we are also making sure that we conveniently called them before they're about to have a bunch of get togethers. In addition, we also know that at the beginning of the year, it's just another opportunity for us to reach out to them and say, hey, we're thankful for you. Uh, Happy New Year. You know, is there anything that, or, and honestly, one of the scripts that we use, and I'll give you the um, number to text to get Jeff's scripts. One of the scripts is I have a goal this year of helping 50 families with buying or selling real estate. Who should I know that you know? And so that's why we make that call at the beginning of the year, because we want to make sure that they know what our goal is and that if they know of anyone that can help me achieve that goal to please pass along their name and number. So the number that you text to get that script is 55444 again. And if you already texted it for social, that's okay, text it again. And it's the word scripts. And it'll have the, I have a goal script in there. Okay. So to recap with the phone, we're making four calls a year. Two of them are surrounding events that you're going to host, and two of them are surrounding holidays. Personally for us, it's Thanksgiving and New Year's, and you heard the logic as to the reason why, but ultimately, you know, you can call whenever you want. I know sometimes some people will do maybe Thanksgiving, and then they'll also do their home anniversary. So if you know that someone sold their home on March 17th, set up your CRM to remind you to call them on March 17th next year and wish them a happy home anniversary. That's another way that you can fit in one of those phone calls if you'd like, okay? The next component of your database is mail. So we do four pieces of mail a day or a day, a year. That would be terrible. Four pieces of mail a year. And then we also add something extra to this that is new to our database plan that I'm gonna share with you guys. So the four letters that we send every single year are first our spring letter, and I'll dive deeper into each of these. Our spring letter, our fall letter, a Christmas card or holiday card, and our year in review letter, which goes out in January. So to dive deeper in both of those or all four of those, the spring letter and the fall letter have the same setup to them. It's very easy for you to duplicate. And in true transparency, we did not get our spring letter out this year because the um, Michigan Baseball League were in their negotiations. And so we basically didn't have enough time to get it out before opening day started. So we're actually sending a summer letter this year. So if you also want to participate, you can do a summer letter with us. And there, the um, three components of the spring and the fall letter are as follows. Number one, you start with what is going on in the market. How do you figure out what's going on in the market? Look at your recent market stats. And that's usually a paragraph. Number two is what you've accomplished. So update them on your progress so far this year. If you called them in January and told them what your goal is, let them know how you're doing so far leading into spring and then again leading into, into fall. It also could be, you know, if you're doing a lot of community work, let them know what community work you're doing. If you are, um, you know, expanding your business, let them know the expansions that you've made. If you've added something new to your business or new team members, let them know that you've added new team members. So whatever it is that you've done within your business. And then the last part, we always talk about how we gave back. So if you know Jeff Glover and Associates, you know that we have Glover's Heroes, which is a nonprofit that Jeff founded a few years ago. And we give back to police officers, veterans, things like that. So that's what we talk about in ours. However, what you can talk about is whatever you're doing in your community. Say you just did a local food drive. Say, you know, for myself, I'm with the animal rescue. I'd be talking about how many animals thus far we saved this year. 
you can find something that you're doing locally in your community and talk about it for two or three sentences. And by the way, if you're not doing something for your community, you need to start because people want to work with people who do good things. And it's another opportunity for yourself to show that you're giving back as you're having success. Okay. So the three parts of those letters, the first starts with a market update. The second is what have you done so far this year? And then the third is how you gave back. Now, if you pay attention, our spring and fall letters also correlate with a client event. So we always make sure to invite them to whatever client event that we're hosting. So the spring one, for example, is inviting them to opening day, which is why we didn't get to do the spring letter because we only had a couple weeks notice on opening day. And then also our fall letter is inviting them to that zoo event, okay? I always get the question of, so do you just do a letter and an envelope? No, we also include a magnet. Um, the magnet is usually the Detroit Tigers baseball schedule, or it is the Detroit Lions football schedule. So obviously, you know, pick your local teams. We buy them from a website called Markful, M-A-R-K-F-U-L. Markful is the company. And we throw those in there as well. Obviously, the whole point is they have our picture on their fridge and they're seeing us literally every time they open the fridge. Okay. Jeff asked the question, um, for phone and mail, are you referring to all of the database, just clients or exchange? So for this, we are referring for the first three, actually the, the four of the database components um, are all to our past clients in Sphere. I'll tell you the one that you give to the exchange as well. And it's solely from a cost standpoint. So we'll get to that, okay? So those are the four letters that we do. We do the spring letter and the fall letter, and then we do a Christmas or holiday card, which obviously that's self-explanatory. We use um, the gallery collection is the name of the company that we buy our Christmas cards through. And it's great because they will um, address them all for us. So we don't have to worry about any of that. We also include again, another magnet, love magnets here. <laughs> The 2023 magnet, we throw those in there too. Our rule of thumb is that those need to be in the mail by December 1st, no later. Why do you think that is? Someone's got it. Not, if not somebody else has already sent it and they're going to have somebody else's picture on the fridge, happens yeah. to me. <laughs> yeah. You know, they're not going to take Miranda off the fridge to put Michelle up. Sorry, Michelle, you know, it, you have to be the first one that they receive. And if your dentist or your attorney or whatever gets to it before you, unfortunately, your, yours is not going to make it on the fridge. I've never seen anyone have three 2023 magnets on their fridge. Okay. All right. And then the last but not least is the year in review. And that actually follows the same format as the spring and fall letter, the three parts. Again, ultimately, we're just letting them know how we ended up that year. We told you our goal, and now we're telling you how we resulted with that goal. And we're thanking you for supporting us with that. Okay. And David asked, yes, it seems like the Christmas holiday card would only be followed by the other one a few weeks later. That is absolutely true. So the Christmas holiday card goes out December 1st. The year in review letter goes out by mid-January. And that's on purpose. Okay, now this is a new part to the mail that I mentioned that has not been included in our database plan before. Some of you have probably heard me talk about it, but it's our very important client boxes. So I'm actually now including this through Glover U as part of our database plan. Essentially what the very important client boxes are is out of your past client and sphere database, you should identify who your top you know, 10 or 20% is. And you need to consistently be doing something special to show them appreciation. And so you need to also determine how you want to decide who that top 10 or 20% is. Is it the person who refers you the most? Is it the person who you know, has done the most business with you? Is it the person who has done the largest sales with you? You personally have to decide who your top 10 or 20% is within your database. What we do within our organization is we have our very important client boxes every single month. We send them out on behalf of our agents. Every month has a theme. So for example, April's theme was a Jeff Glover and Associates umbrella with flower seeds. And it said, April showers, bring May flowers. Okay. 
Um, May's box was Cinco de Mayo themed. It had, you know, a whole tortilla chip, salsa, a maraca, margarita mix. Um, June's theme is coming out next week for our agents. And it says, um, have a ball this summer. And don't forget to give me a call if I can help with buying or selling a home. So we have a beach ball in there. We've got some sunscreen. We've got some Jeff Glover and Associates sunglasses that we're throwing in there. Um, lemonade mix. All of those things, if you're hearing, are low cost, right? I think probably it's costing us maybe $8, $7 for each of these boxes. Then we mail them out to each of our clients. Um, if you can, I would encourage you actually to door knock them and drop them off. Obviously, the face-to-face -face interaction is a better return on investment. For our organization, we cover the entire state of Michigan, so it's a little bit hard for our agents to do that, but you will see a better return on investment. So Don Bass, I see you on our Zoom today. Next time we send out your June boxes, I actually encourage you to drop them off versus mailing them. Um, Beth asked, does that cost include the box itself as well? Yes, it does. A lot of people ask the question of which company do we order our boxes through? It's U line, the letter U and then the word line. We buy a crinkle paper, throw some crinkle paper in there, um, and then we mail them out. I was looking to see if I had one laying around here to show you guys. I don't think I do. Um, but again, so people always ask the question, how do you figure out what goes in the box? What's going on that month, right? Last This month, Cinco de Mayo. Next month, it's summer, so I picked a summer theme. All of the stuff that we put in there, you can buy on Amazon and you can buy in bulk. You assemble them really quick. It takes us maybe one afternoon. We mail them out, okay? So that's the, the final part to the mail. So you've got four letters a year. And then in my opinion, you've got a client box either once a month or you do it quarterly. It's up to you. Our agents, personally, um, most of them, we, Don asked, are you going to send them to me? Yes, we will drop them off to you so that way you can go take them to everyone else. Um, most of our agents send them out every single month. Some of them send them every, every other month. They rotate between like an A and a B list. So that way the clients get them, you know, every other month. Um, some of our agents do them quarterly. Essentially each month we de debut the box and then they can decide how many or how little they want to order. Don, I will say does the, you know, the most usually, like he said, between 50 and 60, we have some agents who only do five. It's up to you. We don't care how many you want to do it. It's completely up to you. And Ellie said, do you have a schedule for that? Yes, we do every month. And then the agents just choose which months they want to participate in. For those of you that run a team, the best way for you to do this, you pay for half and they pay for half. So if the box total is $8, they're paying $4, we're paying $4, and then we handle the execution of getting them out. It's a good way to get their buy-in in the program as well and make sure that they're actually following up with those clients and so forth. A little bit of skin in the game. All right, so that's the last part of the mail. We're gonna move on to email. So Jeff, to answer your question, this one is where I would include the Exchange database. And ultimately at the end of the day, yes, we could offer the other things to our Exchange database. Yet when we figure, you know, a sign call, the, you know, with the amount of opportunities that you have coming in, they're not always going to result in clients, right? Let's be honest. And so if I send every single one of these people a letter in the mail, that's obviously at 80,000 people going to get very expensive very quick. <laughs> so I guess I'm cheap and I just email to them instead. And then it's obviously still staying in front of them. It's just at a more cost-effective um, format, in my opinion. Okay, so for email, we do 12 emails a year. I'm gonna share with you some examples of different things that we send out. My number one rule of thumb is you are never to do a market update email. Please never add me to your email distribution and have the letter or the subject line be Jessica's May market update. You're always going to, and honestly, I, I've had coaching clients where I've asked them, hey, listen, I know you've done it this way for two years. I'm just gonna ask you for the next six months to change the titles to some of the suggestions that I give you and tell me what your open rate has changed to. Their open rate skyrockets because it's not just another sales email. We're coming from contribution and the agents who come from contribution and show a value to their clients are the ones that get a return on their business. Okay, so here's some examples. Example number one, every state has 4th of July fireworks. 
every state usually has a news station or a newspaper that debuts all of the different locations that there's going to be fireworks. Find it, make an email surrounding it, and send it out to your people. You know, if you service a primarily one area, say it's, you know, Oakland County's 4th of July fireworks schedule for the next two weeks, send that out. I promise you families in your, your um, past client and sphere database are going to appreciate having that in one spot. Another one that we've done in the past is Jeff's top five cider mills. Now, no, we did not send Jeff to every cider mill and have him rank them, although he probably would have enjoyed that. Uh, we just found the top five that another um, news station did and we compared it with a different news station and we picked the five that we thought looked the best <laughs> and sent that out and that was Jeff's top five cider mills. Same thing, you can do that too, that's your fall one. Um, in Michigan, we're known for our Michigan colors do a, a email blast about the different places to see the Michigan colors. Say you guys have a great local basketball or baseball team. Promote, you know, that it's, you know, Miggy's 3000th, whatever hit pitch, whatever that was. Clearly you can tell I don't watch baseball, but do things that like people are actually going to open. Okay. Uh, I don't think he pitches. I think he just hits. So I guess it's 3000 hit. Yep. Okay. Randy shaking your head. Yes. <laughs> so my point is, it's come up with things that people would actually open. I've also said, you know, a way to make this really easy is refer to the national holidays. So I constantly look up June national holidays and I scroll the month to try to see, you know, whatever, like an example is national chocolate chip cookie day. I've asked Jeff's mom before for her chocolate chip recipe. And I literally created an email and sent it out to the database. And the subject line was Jeff's mom's chocolate chip cookie recipe on National Chocolate Chip Cookie Day, right? You pair the two together, okay? So you don't have to, I think what ends up happening with a lot of the people is that they like, they wanna do an email blast every single month and they resort to the market update because that's easy. Now at the bottom of your emails, you can absolutely give a brief market update, right? It's spring, sales prices are up. You know, we're looking at, you know, homes that have increased in value, 50, $60,000 over the last year, if you wanna know what your home's value is, give me a call. It could be the last sentence at the end. It is never the focus though, okay? Always come from contribution, always come with something fun that they'd wanna read, okay? I also have always followed the rule of thumb and you probably see it in our Glover U email sometimes. The less, it, less is better, less is more, right? You don't wanna constantly give it away what they're going to be reading in the email. We want them to open it and do a quick scroll. Robert asked the question, is there a specific day that you send the email out? Obviously, if it's in relation to a day, like National Chocolate Chip Cookie Day, it's obviously gonna go on that day. Otherwise, I try to do it on like Wednesdays or Tuesdays. I see that when we send emails on the weekend, people are too busy. I also always try to do it either early in the morning, meaning that they watch it for, or they read it while they're um, drinking their coffee or Number two, you know, at the end of the day when they're winding down. I try to not send it in the middle of the day because it ends up getting lost in the shuffle. Okay. Now someone asked the question of, can these email blasts be used for Facebook? Yes. So the point that I made earlier when I said, um, do a recording of yourself in the Facebook group of the local market updates and download it, that could be something that you drop at the bottom of the email. So there's a video of you. Don't feel like you have to rethink a social media post, a mail post, an email post. You can repurpose these things. And the reason why I say that is because not all consumers respond the same way. A consumer may respond better to your social media post than they do the piece of mail that you receive. Another consumer may respond better to the phone call that you left versus the email that you sent. So don't feel like someone's going to say, oh man, I saw they posted that on Facebook. They also left me that in a phone call and I got that in the mail. That has literally never happened and it won't happen. So you don't feel like you have to recreate that every single time. Okay. Um, Jeanette asked the question, MailChimp has a 2000 per month for free. Um, we've used Constant Contact or we, we do pay for MailChimp. It's not that expensive. Constant Contact and MailChimp are the two that we've used. Okay. And then last but not least, the fifth part of the database component is events. So I mentioned earlier, pay attention to when you're hosting your event for your database. 
are you pairing it around a time that is either right before your busy season or in your busy season? For example, I will never host an event the week before Christmas. One, no one's going to attend. And two, that doesn't help me, right? It's not like people are getting ready to put their home on the market leading into January. Instead, we host the Tigers opening day event and that's paired with April. What starts in April? Everyone starts thinking about getting their home ready for sale and or getting it ready for sale. So if you're hosting these events, you need to make sure that you're pairing it for when it makes sense um, for your business, depending on where you're located. Okay. Um, also, side note, when we host our events at Jeff Glover and Associates, we host two big events a year that are our Jeff Glover and Associates events. But then we encourage our agents to host their own events. And the reason why we do that is because for those of you that manage teams, um, as your business continues to grow, people won't necessarily have a relationship with Jeff, right? A buyer or a seller doesn't have a relationship with Jeff. They have a relationship with Don. And so we want to invite them to those big events so they can see the power of the organization. But it's also important for Don to have a personal connection with those clients, not Jeff. Right? They're not working with Jeff, they're working with Don, who works with Jeff Glover and Associates. So we encourage our agents to host smaller client events through the year. And when I talk, when I say smaller, I mean like 25, 30, 50, 75 people versus a couple hundred for the big events that we host. When we host them, and I'm going to give you some examples of some of the events that we host, we encourage our agents to pick one. We plan it for them. We take care of everything. We just ask them to split the cost with us 50-50. And again, that reasoning is because we want them to have some skin in the game and making sure that they've got attendance and so forth. So examples of smaller client events you can do, a cider mill event is super easy. Um, you can do a movie theater event. You can do a happy hour. During COVID, we did a lot of virtual cooking classes, which were pretty cool. Um, you could do a barbecue. That's one that we've done before. We've done a tailgate before. Um, obviously you can do pie events and things like that. I'm not the biggest fan of those, but you can do a pie event. Basically things that are a smaller scale that gives you one-on-one -on -one interaction. And the reason why people always like cringe when I say I don't love pie events, the reason why I don't love them is because they're there for five minutes picking up the pie and then they get in their car and they leave. <laughs> Where at a cider mill event, they're sticking around for a little while, they're going on a hayride, you know, they're doing all of that kind of stuff where I'm able to be around them for a little bit longer. So when you consider expense, I would prefer an event where I can stay with them for 90 minutes versus them grabbing something for three and then heading in their car. Okay. And then last but not least, um, under events, the last thing is, and I know we talk about this all the time at different Glover U events, so most of you probably know this, anytime you are hosting an event, encourage someone in that database, so in that past client or sphere database, to invite a friend. So if I'm inviting Jessica, I'm encouraging Jessica to also bring Alex to the event or one of her friends, because now if I didn't have a relationship with Alex, guess what? Now I do because they came to my event, they had a good time, they got a chance to meet with me, and now I've added them to that Sphere and Past Client database, okay? They're part of my Sphere now. They were part of Randy's Sphere, now they're my Sphere, okay? Now I'm also adding them on Facebook and increasing that, that relationship a little bit more. That is the quickest and cheapest way to double your database with your highest quality of client because they already can trust you because their friend used you or knows you you brought them to their your event where you showed them appreciation and they didn't even do any business with you. And then three, you stayed connect, connected with them. Jessica asked the best way to capture their info is have at all of these events, you need to have like an Eventbrite or something where they register in advance and you encourage them, you know, hey, you've got four tickets, you know, register Jessica, Wing Wing and your two friends, okay? And so when you get that information, you then add that to your database. I personally do not add them to my exchange database, and I'm going to tell you why I add them to the past client and sphere instead, is because they already came to something and they hung out with me for a time period. They are a lot deeper in my sales funnel, in my opinion, than a sign call that called and I've been reaching out to them three or four times and they haven't returned my phone calls. 
that's someone that I want to make sure receives this five key components on an annual basis because they are most likely to return that business to me. Okay. So now homework for you all. I wouldn't be a coach unless I assigned you homework. The best way for you to implement these five database components is I want you to print out a June, July, August, September, October, November, and December calendar. Lay them out and figure out for the remainder of this year, what months are you sending a piece of mail? What months are you doing the phone calls? What are your email blasts each month? And what client event are you hosting between now and the end of the year, if not two? Where you will succeed with seeing that increase of your database business, you know, going from 15 to 52% is if you plan it out in advance versus trying to figure it out as you go. The number one mistake agents make is they're like, oh man, it's June. What am I going to do for my database this year? You should be planning for June back in March. Obviously we can't go back in time. So you at least need to be planning for it now between the end of the year. And it's a hundred times easier if you have a calendar like this, where you're writing out all of those things. And then that way I know on the 26th that I need to be sending out this email and I can start working on it on the first or the second versus waiting until the 26th. The quality of what you send out is going to be a lot better when we're more proactive versus reactive with that. And it's gonna be a whole lot less stressful on you because you know it for the rest of the year. You just gotta go through and implement it, okay? All right, awesome. So that is our five database components. Let Jeff know that I've revised the database plan, please. And I've determined that this is our new database plan at Glover U moving forward. From the person who actually implements it, I feel like I have the right to rename it. So there it is. What kind of questions do you have about what we talked about today? What things do you feel like you need to implement that you haven't been? What things um, you know, are you already doing that you can maybe double down on? Or what was your biggest aha that you're like, oh crap, I gotta get better here. Drop them in the chat or ask questions if you want me to you know, clarify on anything that we talked about. I know there were a few that I potentially may have missed. Where are you traveling to right now, Heather? Or is that a Zoom background? No, I'm, I'm at the airport. My flight got delayed. <laughs> so I'm going to New York City life. for my birthday. <laughs> um, I was curious if, along with your spring and fall letters where you mention your events that you're having, are you also sending out like a separate like invitation to these events via mail or is it just included in that letter? It's in that letter. So like with our Detroit Tigers opening day event, um, I was hoping I had one sitting here. I don't. Um, we are sending, it actually looks like a Tigers ticket. Like if you were going to the Tigers game and we send four of those in there. Again, the reason why we're sending four is because two are for them and two are for a friend. So we're throwing that in there too. So in that letter is the actual letter itself, the Detroit Tigers baseball magnet, and then four ticket invites. Now, obviously if that works for that event, otherwise it would just be like a postcard invite that we also slide into that. But yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, Jeanette asked, can you please repeat the homework? Yes. It's figure out what you're doing. What are you implementing between now and the end of the year? Look at each month and figure out what your email blast is. What day does it need to go out? Laura asked, do you ever ask for the referral um, throughout the year or is it just the January calls? Naturally, when I am stay staying in front of them consistently on a monthly, quarterly basis, I'm indirectly asking for it. I'll tell you, in my opinion, our agents who have and follow this database plan to a T actually don't have to ask for the business. It naturally just comes. If your realtor was sending you a gift every other month because you're one of their top clients, who are you going to remember when your friend says that they're considering buying or selling? I'm not going to consider the realtor down the street. I'm going to consider the realtor who's been sending me something every single month or coming from value. Jeff asked the new social media calendar. Is that the one that was shared at the summit? No, we revised it actually. So make sure you get the new one. We added a couple more things to it. Okay, what else? Um, Alicia asked, can you repeat what you put in the summer box? Yes, it has a beach ball. So honestly, guys, if you want to start this next month, here you go. This is what you put in it. Um, I don't have one put together yet. 
it's I debut it on Tuesday. It's a beach ball. It's a lemonade packet. It's a small thing of sunscreen. It's um, sunglasses. It's a, um, I actually found them on Amazon. It's a flip flop bottle opener. I think I got like 40 of them for 40 bucks. And then um, I think that's it. And then it's got this little have a ball this summer card that you put in it. You throw some crinkle paper in there. You throw all the stuff in. And then obviously I prefer that you drop it out to them. But if you can't, then mail it. Okay. Boxes, how big are they? Like that size. It cost maybe anywhere from five to six dollars to mail. Alicia asked, is that for your top 20% clients? Um, so it's up to you. you. You know, as an agent, if you want to send it to your entire database, absolutely, it's just gonna be really expensive. I encourage our agents to, you know, whoever has maybe recently sent you a referral, send one to them. Um, send it to your best referring clients, you know, send it to someone. If you know that their birthday is in June, send it to them in June. You know, you can use your discretion on who you want to send it to. Katie's right. She said you line. And then Katie also asked, do you track what your best ROI is after the five different types of forms? Um, are you, if you're referring to the database components, I'll tell you our number one re return on investment is our events because it we're physically, oh, Sarah's got a box. See, she's holding, I don't know if you guys can see, she's holding one. It's kind of blurry in the background. That's actually one of the bigger ones. We put a wine bottle in that. That was something different that we were doing, but they're no, you know, they're like this size. Um, the return on investment we get the most from are events, right? Because they also cost the most in most cases. So, and, and also you're in front of them for 90 minutes. So we hosted our Detroit Tigers opening day event back in April. And I know from that event, we had at least 10 to 15 sales as a result of that. But we also had 800 people in attendance. So, you know, figure out that whatever that ratio is. But you'll always have your highest return on investment from a client event because you just saw them face to face. You'll never be a face to face. Beth asked, how far in advance do you need to order the boxes? Are they the same box every month? Um, no, you just order them off a of Uline and they take two days to arrive. It's pretty easy. It's a great company. Okay. Maybe I need to open up a very important client um, box company where you guys can just order your boxes <laughs> and we just sit here and, and box them every day. And I'll tell Jeff that I have an idea for a new company. Okay. All right. Well, thanks guys. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out, drop them in the inner circle. And if you just like Jessica, you know, said, Hey, listen, I need you to dive deeper in the database components. I want to implement this stuff in my business. If you also ever have something like that, shoot me the idea. And if I have enough people who ask questions on it and I've got, you know, enough content that I can feel, fill it with, I will always, you know, hop on these for you anytime you need them. Thanks for being a part of the Glover U family. Talk to you guys later.